So looking at some other tools, of course, of great importance, and sometimes it's overlooked. I've seen technicians over the years put things together just with impact guns and say, well, that's tight because I know my impact gun. You can't really determine that from an impact gun because things change, the gun wears, the, uh, the tool might be of a different configuration that changes the actual torque, um, the uh, air volume coming to that particular tool may be different from shop to shop or time to time because the air compressor is on or it's not on. Um, I would highly recommend that anytime you are putting something together that requires a torque that you make sure that you use a torque wrench to bring it up to that torque and not beyond. The purpose behind having the torque for understanding is to bring that fastener within a certain tensile stretch that causes the thread on the male and the female portion of the fastener to interact with each other and wind up. Now if you think about how the torque value works, it would be like taking two door wedges which are inclined planes which is a fourth class lever and you put the two of them together and if we were to put the two wedges together as they come together within a certain space they're going to create a certain amount of clamping force. So if we were to hammer the two wedges within a hole they would tighten right up and then there would be a certain amount of torque clamping force and that's what manufacturers talk about is how much clamping force do we need to hold that head in place which really is an understanding of torquing a fastener or multiple fasteners to create that amount of clamping force to hold something in place. So a bunch of variations on these tools. These tools here which is a swing type gauge and you can see I can just move this and anytime we put the torque on here it just bends the bar and then the center anvil uh, indicator stays straight when the bar bends then it's actually distorting and then we just read the value of how far the torque is on the meter face. The nice thing about these is they never really go out of calibration because all you need to do is prior to starting is bend that indicator right to zero and then you're ready to go each and every time. You shouldn't be using these for breaking torque Sometimes uh, a technician might need a long tool like this for breaking a torque. It's not really going to hurt it. You shouldn't be using it though. Uh, but the only thing you would have to do in this particular case if you did use it for a breaker bar is make sure it's calibrated before you start. The most common one we use, and I didn't bring a digital one out, um, I kind of like the manual ones better because you have a better feel for it than the digital. A lot of technicians today uh, with technology like the digital ones, there are some that are GPS tracks, so no matter where you are pulling this way, this way, or this way, um, it's going to read exactly based on GPS tracking. So those are pretty expensive. They do go out of calibration because they are a digital electronic tool that is being used to ascertain a torque, which is a large value in a lot of cases. And they could be small. The small ones, there are small little torque wrenches, which are inch pound wrenches. And uh, anytime we're using an inch pound wrench, then we can still um, find out exactly what value it is based on foot pounds by dividing by 12. So this wrench here has a lock on it for locking the value. We can just dial this in to the value and then lock it and then we would pull it up based on the ratchet movement. Now when torquing is being done, we don't want to do jerk torque up to that value. Sometimes the values can be very high, three, four, five hundred foot-pounds of torque. If that happens to be the case, then you need to get your body in a position or somebody to help hold the other end of the wrench in place. For example, doing U-bolts on a front axle. You need a technician to hold that socket in while you're under the truck on a creeper and pulling it to that torque. And we want to do, again, not a jerk torque up to that value because that can actually cause an incorrect value. We want to actually pull it consistently until we hear the click on that torque wrench, which is very common. A lot of technicians will double click, click, click to show that they've pulled that torque and then made sure that that torque is accurate. 
So the other thing that can be used in, based on manufacturer specification, there are what's called a torque to yield fastener. And that torque to yield fastener means that the manufacturer wants a certain torque put on that fastener. For example, 90 foot pounds plus 120. So 120 can, depending on the size of the fastener, it can be anywhere from about 30 to 60 foot-pounds of additional torque. That's not a given rule of thumb or precise accuracy because the fastener size, based on its tensile strength, is going to determine how much more the torque to yield value will allow that extra torque to be put on it. So in that particular case, we would just assemble uh, what's called a torque angle meter onto the torque wrench or onto a bar. So for example on a Caterpillar bottom end, if memory serves me correct, I think it's about 300 foot-pounds plus 90 degrees. So when we have to do 300 foot-pounds, we pull that up with the torque wrench to click it to 300 and then we would put a torque angle meter on it and then pull it that additional 90 degrees. So depending on the size of that fastener is going to determine what value of additional torque we're putting on there. In fact, if I remember, if memory serves me correctly, Caterpillar asked for you to torque it to 300 and then turn it 120 degrees, which is two flats and a lot of the times that is right in the service manual to be done with an impact gun. So what they want to do is they want to bring that up to a torque, then put an additional amount of torque turn or torque to yield. The yield is within about the 5% of the fastener from fracturing so that it actually puts that clamping force on that inclined plane, which are the, the the male and the female portions of those fasteners as they are intersecting with each other to maintain that clamping force. So when this gets installed, it gets the socket gets put, put on, the wrench gets put on here. I would recommend that you use a breaker bar or a long ratchet. And then this gets locked in a position to actually hold the face. So what happens is you dial this face to zero once the tool is in place, you pick a spot where this is going to stop it so when it goes to turn that it's not going to allow it to turn. We lock it in position and then we pull that torque and then we pull it until, for example, we get the 60 degrees we want to turn or like I had mentioned, 120 degrees which is two flats. Okay, so when we turn that, the, 100, uh, the 120 degrees, we've actually turned two flats and that puts the torque to what's called torque to yield and that again only goes by manufacturer's recommendation. A lot of the times torque to yield fasteners do not get reused because they're pulling within that 5% of the stretch of that bolt and then when they're released they don't always come back to where they were. So then when you go to pull them again now you're going beyond that 5% and the likelihood of that fastener snapping is pretty good. So again, we don't want to run that risk, especially if it's something that's holding together a rotating assembly like the bottom end of an engine. So in the case of over torquing things, sometimes what happens is we get thread pulls or stripping. The pull is where we're actually starting to pull the thread. It hasn't quite stripped yet, but it is going to strip if we keep turning. So in the case that we do strip a fastener, then we can do a repair with a helicoil kit. And this happens to be a helicoil kit for a 3 8 national course 16 threads per inch fastener. So we have a tool for installing the helicoil. We have a helicoil tap. We have a tool, a magnet for picking out any debris out of the hole and installing this and it's also meant to pull out the little tang and I'll explain that as we go and then of course the drill bit that is needed for this. These kits can be fairly expensive but they're very accurate. Now the Healy coil tap is a tap that manufacturers make to install a replacement thread. It doesn't quite fit on here because it is the dimension of the outside of these threads that we are installing into the hole. 
And what happens here is it says right on the Healy coil tap what size drill bit is supposed to be used. Very hard to see. I don't think we're going to see this one in the camera, but it tells you the drill bit size. I can't even read that without looking at it through the magnifying glass, but it gives us the drill bit size for this. Then we drill out the original threads which makes the hole larger than the OEM thread. Then we would take our Healy coil tap and the tool is convenient, gives us like a little T handle here and we can tap this down in back and forth and we tap it till we bottom it and to the dimension of the hole. And we bring it back out, blow it out, clean it out with brake clean or some other type of solvent that's going to remove any of the oils in there. And then we would install the Healy coil thread replacement with the tool. Now this can be adjusted to correspond with how far it's going down onto the threads. There are some of these Healy coils which are over length because sometimes there's a really long threaded hole that needs to be repaired and sometimes the threads may be below that deck surface or below the surface of that component so we have to go down further with a longer thread to actually get down there so this is what this adjuster is for here you can see that this slides on to the end of the Healy coil itself so once it slides on and I usually like to put these together with red Loctite, which I think is 292, or um, some uh, bearing retainer, which is a green Loctite, I can't remember the number. And we put that on there, and then we wind this down into the hole, right to the bottom, and then we were to snap the tang off, and there is a little nick on the tang right here. And that little tang gets broken off, so it allows the fastener to travel just a little bit further. So depending on how far it goes down determines your type of repair that you're doing, and that would be technician judgment on how far it has to go to basically do its job. So normally we snap that tang off of there that allows the, the threaded portion of the fastener to continue on down through the hole and to its bottomed area. So then we normally you would let this dry for a bit of time and personally what I do in this case is once that thread locker the the Loctite has dried up then I take a regular tap or even prior to it drying up take a regular tap and if this is a 3 8 national course 16 threads per inch which the kit is then we would take that tap and just wind it down through the threads to clean the threads out so that once it is dry or you are ready to install the fastener then it goes in clean and dry into that hole and then the locker is still on the outside to lock the threads in place problem is if we lather this up with Loctite, put it in, and then we wind the fastener in, when we go to take the fastener out, then the threads may come back out of the bore with it. So the idea would be do the repair, let it set, clean it out or prior to, then put it together once it's dry and then you have a brand new thread back in position to create the torque needed to hold that fastener and that component together in place. So there, these are available from your local jobbers. Uh, this kit in particular, I can't remember exactly how many were in here. I think there was eight of them in here. And uh, all the equipment needed to do the repair uh, in the kit. And they did come with instructions, but we know and through these videos that we have some instruction here. This kit is around, I think it's close to $100, but it does do a lot of repairs. And I just keep this handy for some of the stuff that we typically end up having to repair in the lab. Uh, and that's because we're putting fasteners in and out, on and off components all the time. So you can get these in metric, standard, fine thread, coarse thread, over length, small ones, and sometimes, depending on your skill set, if you're pretty good at it, you can stack these to use two of them 
so that they, when you break the little tang off, that they intersect with each other and then they make an over length one. So practice these up and you know, they, they do work very well for all thread repairs.